Hi, welcome to this first session of a 15 session statistics class. I thought I'd use this session to do the groundwork for the class. Talk a little bit about what I think statistics is all about, what it's designed to do, and also talk about the different pieces of statistics while also laying out a motivation for why we should care. So let's get the process started. Statistics is about dealing with data. You think, what is data? It's pretty much any kind of information that you can obtain. That information can be quantitative. It can be a number or it can be qualitative. Sometimes we try to make qualitative data into quantitative numbers, as is the case when somebody asks you on a pain scale to put your pain between 0 and 10. Pain is a qualitative feeling, but people try to convert it into numbers. Data can be continuous or discrete. The score in a basketball game is discrete. You can score 82 points or 84 points or 83 points. You cannot score 83.5 points. Your height is continuous. It can be anywhere from 3 feet to 7 feet, but it doesn't have to move in particular steps. We've always relied on data for decision making, but we've become much better at collecting, finding, chronicling that data, storing it, and making it accessible to a larger audience. 200 years ago, even if you knew statistics, getting to the data to apply those statistics would have been difficult. Today, it's a no-brainer. So let's get this show on the road. What is statistics? I call statistics the data science. It's a discipline that allows you to look at data, understand it, gather it, analyze it, depict it, and make sense of it. In fact, the way I describe statistics is what you can use to convert data into information. Let's face it, we're surrounded with data. A lot of it is useless, much of it is contradictory, but statistics finds a way to make sense of the data and convert to information. Defined as such, statistics includes every aspect of data, from collecting and recording the data, to processing the data, the analysis of the data, and the depiction of the data, they're all part of statistics. Now, if you break down statistics into its many parts, you can already see why we need statistics more than ever before. We now have, as I said, more access to data than ever before. And by we, we in, uh, include every, every, not just professionals, but everybody in the game has more access to data. Second, we face a problem of data overload. In many cases, I think our complaint shouldn't be that we don't have enough data. It's we have too much data pulling us in different directions, leaving us often very confused about what to do. So you know what we do? And this is, I think, one of the ironies of having so much data. When we're overloaded by data, we do what human beings always do. We fall back on rules of thumb. Those rules of thumb might have been developed 50 years ago when the data didn't exist, but we go back to them because they feel comfortable. And we adopt mental shortcuts. What a men what's a mental shortcut? We do something that worked for us the last time around, even though it was a different place in a different context. You see, that makes no sense. We're human beings. What we do doesn't have to make sense. And statistics, as I mentioned in the pre preview to the class, drives almost everything we do in our lives. In fiscal policy, in healthcare, in our personal lives, what we see, what we do is often driven by statistics. Sometimes the statistics is used well, sometimes it's used badly. But making good policy and personal decisions requires an understanding of statistics. Because if we misread the data, we can make some very bad decisions, both as individuals and as society. Which brings me to a point that I think needs to be made. Statistics is often viewed as a quantitative discipline, but it's a discipline and often because it's a quantitative discipline, people operate in the delusion that it cannot be weaponized, that it cannot be, that you can't bring bias to data. That's not true. As access to data is improved, the misuse of the data is also picked up because people selectively pick out how they sample the data, how they measure what the data is telling you. And because of that, agenda-driven data is all around us. And if you add to that social media, Facebook, Twitter, it's amazing how bad data can drive out good data. 
In fact, um, in economics, there's a law called Gresham's Law. And Gresham's Law basically says that bad money drives out good money. In other words, if you have fake coins and real coins both circulating, after a while, the real coins which are made of gold or silver will disappear. Only the fake coins will be around. And with social media, often bad data drives out good data. And as people weaponize data and use selective statistics to back up their agendas, the onus is shifted to individuals, you and I, to decide what data to trust and what to discard and the right questions to ask. And in the process, look for red flags that can tell you when the data is being manipulated. Because if it is, you cannot trust the conclusions that come out of that data. Along the way, one of the big buzzwords in business has become big data. What's big data? It doesn't just refer to the quantity of data. That's one aspect of it. It's also that the data that's being collected is data that could not have been collected a decade ago, 20 years ago, because it would have been personal and nobody would have been able to observe it. It's a very simple example. Think of location data. I joke about the time when I went on my iPhone and I checked to see how many apps were tracking my location. I found 27 apps. That's location data. It's being collected. Somebody's using it. Whether they can make money, any money on it is a different question. But big data refers to the coming together of technology and data, essentially of data being collected and potentially being used by companies to make decisions on how to make more money off us. And along with big data has come the term data analytics. Again, sounds fancy, but all statistics is data analytics. The only difference being that when the databases get really big and a mix of quantitative and qualitative data, data analytics applied in the context of big data refers to how to work with very large data sets. Data sets we'd only dreamed about 50 years ago, 30 years ago, even 20 years ago and combining both quantitative and qualitative data to come up with composite results. So you ready? Let's look at the pieces that go into statistics because it covers the whole spectrum of data. It starts, of course, with collecting data, storing it, and sampling from that data. The very first exercise in data collection were physical. You met with people, you collected the data, you put it in forms, and you stored it somewhere. That started hundreds of years ago. But what's changed is technology and the digitization of data has allowed us to collect a lot more data and find what we're looking for a lot more easily than in the old days. Now, of course, as data has become bigger, we also face the challenge that with large populations, it's impossible to look at everybody as you sample the data. You think, what are you talking about? There are literally hundreds of thousands of businesses around the world. We can't check to see how every business behaves, so we sample businesses. We sample only publicly traded companies, only U.S. publicly traded companies, only large U.S. publicly traded companies. We do it for lots of reasons, for convenience, for speed, for, for practicality. We're going to spend some time talking about sampling along this way because Often statistics starts with how you sample, how well you sample. Because there are two sins, which if you commit at the start of the process in your sampling, the rest of the process falls apart. The first is the sin of bias. Creating bias samples will give you results that will not tell you much about the population. We'll talk about the subtle and not so subtle ways in which bias enters sampling. The second is noise. What does that mean? When you create a sample and you come up with a conclusion and you extrapolate to the population, you're making an estimate. Because the, the extrapolation you make is never going to be perfect. It comes with noise or, or error. And knowing what that standard error noise is, is critical to understanding statistics. So it's data collection and sampling. Second, once you've collected that sample data, you compute what are called descriptive statistics. And I'm going to call them, in short, data descriptives. What you're trying to do is take a mound of data and summarize it in ways that people can understand. That summarization can take the form of measures of location. So you take 100 data points and you give me an average. You're at least giving me a measure of across the 100 what's a typical number. 
you can get a measures of dispersion. Once you give me the typical number, you can tell me how much variation there is around that typical number. And you can also give me measures of skewness, which is, are you more likely to get numbers that exceed your typical number or are less than your typical number? Location, dispersion, skewness. We'll come in and fill in the details in a couple of sessions. Because these data descriptives become shorthand for characterizing the data. So rather than giving me every single detail of a hundred different observations, you give me these summary statistics. Third, often when you have data across a bunch of observations, you can take the data and visually present it in what's called a histogram. A histogram sounds fancy, but it's just counting the number of observations within ranges of the data. So if I took 100 people and I measure the height of each one, I can then create a histogram of the entire sample by looking at how many people are less than five feet, five feet to five feet, two inches, etc. And you can draw a histogram. It's a good place to visualize the data. And often you can replace the histograms, if you can find a good fit, with one of the standard distributions in statistics. You think like what? I'll give you the distribution that most of you still remember from your statistics class, a normal distribution. But it's one of dozens of distributions in statistics. You say, why would I need a distribution? What do I gain? One of the advantages of using a statistical distribution is statistical distribution come with properties that have already been fleshed out. Saves you a lot of trouble then if you're trying to make judgments based on the data. So when you look at these standardized distributions, there are distributions for discrete variables as well as continuous variables. The distributions can be symmetric. In other words, the upside looks very much like the downside or asymmetric. One side has a longer tail, more likely to get up or down. And we'll talk about both kinds of distributions. So collect the data and sample it, data descriptives, data distributions. But once you have data on multiple variables, it is almost inevitable that you start asking questions about how the variables move, to, move with each other. It can be two variables or more, but let's take two as a starting point. Sometimes you look to see how they move with each other simply because you want to chronicle how they, they move together. There's no deeper reason. You're not trying to put a story there. You're just trying to chronicle these two variables move with each other. But all too often you go from there to causation, where you're saying one variable causes the other. And it's a little trickier than it looks at the outside, because how do you decide whether A causes B or B causes A? And finally, if you can link the two variables and provide some causation, maybe you can even make forecasts of one of the variables using the other. Now, just to provide some an, an, a simple example, think about stock prices and interest rates. Do stock prices move with interest rates? Well, I could do a, 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 I could find out whether that's true. Whether do stock prices move together? They move in opposite directions. Do they? Are they unrelated? If they move together, then I can ask: Do higher stock prices cause higher interest rates? Do higher interest rates cause? So let's say I find that stock price and interest rates move in opposite directions. I could ask, do higher stock prices cause lower interest rates or do lower interest rates cause higher stock prices? And if I can establish a link and a causation, then I can ask, can I predict future stock prices based on where rates are right now? So basically, we've gone from chronicling to causation to prediction. Now, one of the one of the other pieces of statistics is probabilities. Probabilities measure the likelihood of something happening. That something could be a discrete event. Will the company go bankrupt or will it stay as a surviving company? That's a discrete event. Or it can be a continuous variable like profits. Will profits exceed a billion? Why is it continuous? Because profits go from zero to 10 billion and they can take on any value. Discrete, you can be either bankrupt or you're not. And you can estimate the probability of an event happening by either looking at historical data, which is what we often do, or we have a statistical distribution for a variable. We can say, based on that distribution, this is the likelihood that earnings will exceed a billion dollars. And if you understand properties, there are tools that come with properties that can be very useful in analysis. 
One is what's called a probit or a logit. We'll come back and talk more about this, but basically think of this as using data to estimate the probability of something happening. What could be that something be? That a company will be acquired, that will go bankrupt. By using observable data, you're trying to make a prediction of that happening. If your risks are discrete, and a classic example for this is um, a drug company putting a drug through the FDA approval process and it's got to pass through three stages. In other words, it either passes or it fails. If it passes and it goes to the next stage, one of the useful tools you can use to assess whether you should start doing research on a drug and how much it's worth is a decision tree where you look at a sequence of events and the likelihood of each happening. And a more expensive use of probabilities is to say, look, rather than value a company with individual inputs for growth and risk, which is what we've traditionally done, why don't we put distributions in for the variables? Remember we talked about distributions, statistical distributions? Distributions in for the variables, each of my input variables, growth and risk and cash flows, and see what the value is as an output variable. So from data collection all the way to probabilistic tools, we're talking about statistics and probability. And you can see already why understanding statistics is going to give you a leg up if you're planning to do investing, corporate finance, or valuation. So for the remaining 13 sessions, I hope to see you along on this ride. Actually, 14 sessions I hope to see you on this ride because in each group of these sessions, we're going to take pieces of what we've talked about and expand on it. Thank you, and I hope you found the session useful.